This is Joe, Joe Moscato, the host of Joe Talk. What we have today will not burn your ears or incite you to violence. We're going to have a, a man-to-man talk, two street photographers getting together and really having a good time and talking about our lives and talking about what we do for us not a living as much as for love. Now I'd like to introduce Kurt Boone. He's a street photographer. He likes to take the pictures like me. He loves to be out in the street. He loves the visions, the opportunities, the people that he meets on the job and puts the shutter and that's love. That's pure love. And we're going to discuss love and photography and art and all kinds of other stuff. Now, I'd like to introduce Kurt. And I'd like to ask him one question. And the main question, my main motivation, and going back all the way back to when I was a wee lad, was my father. And he was basically the inspiration to my introduction to photography. And I believe your father was also an introduction to you with photography. Now, getting back, going, clicking, snapping off thing is getting back to when we were kids. What was your main inspiration and where did it come from? Okay, so you're, yeah, so thank, thank you for your uh, interviewing me, Joe. Um, okay, so my inspiration goes way back, as you mentioned, to when, when I was a toddler. So uh, my dad was kind of my whole, my whole world, and he took pictures of the family. So he was a, a family uh, type photographer. He would, he would take pictures of whatever family events we were going to, whether it be uh, a craft, a craft fest with his brother, or we're going to church, he would, he would take, take pictures of that. And, and then the second thing was my, my mother, she had um, photo, she kept photo albums. So that was her thing. So she kept photo albums of all the photos my dad took and she would put them in these albums to kind of preserve the, the family history kind of like. Now, my mother also was able to have photos from her parents. So she had photos from the 1890s to the early 1900s of uh, family members. So growing up, I would look through those photo albums and see those relatives uh, from the 1890s and the 19, early 1900s. And so that was, that was fascinating as, as well. So those two things were really important in, in, the, um, in my childhood. And then the third piece is my mother would buy photography books of uh, African, African-American heritage. And he was kind of coffee table books. So uh, one book she bought was Crossing the River. It was a photo book of, uh, of African-Americans. And then she bought a, a photo book of fantasy. And these were like coffee table books. So when people come in the house, they could browse through these, these books. So I was always around photographs. And I, I like photography, but my thing was, 
I didn't take pictures. I knew what photos look like, and I know what a good photo looked like because I studied it so much, but I didn't take pictures. So as I grew up, I would just hang around professional photographers and flip through contemporary photography books as something for me to do. I didn't take pictures because I was, I felt I was clumsy. Kurt, so, I got a yeah. question for you. Yeah. Did your father have equipment? Yes, he had, cameras. he had two cameras, two cameras. And I still have my, both my father's cameras in storage. The only part I don't know offhand right now is what, what was the name of those cameras? But they were old, they were old film cameras. And I believe the brands that they were, they don't exist no more. So, so there was these two old film cameras that I have in storage. So he, he used those. And he used those for like, I'm 16 years old and my father died about nine years ago. So he used those cameras for almost 40 or 50 years. So where did you kind of like go in the direction of your life? Because in my case, my father was sort of like um, a photographer, fine art photographer, who got rid of all his stuff and only left me with his camera and uh, only kind of like memories from uh, my mother. And I was like always sort of obsessed with kind of like bringing him back in a sense I thought and I understood that he felt that he didn't have an opportunity, you know, raising a family and working to pursue his art, which that's what he felt it was, that was his art. So I always had this kind of feeling that I wanted to pursue it for him. So that, that's always like a, a rationale or reason why you do and why you don't uh, do something. Interesting. So, it's very interesting. My, my story is completely like different. I only, only thing I, 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 I think about now, if my father, and my mother were alive and they they were able to see my success as a photographer as a photographer they would be like totally surprised but they would enjoy it and so but they they passed away not really knowing that i would become this street photographer that that would get recognition for my work so that's my kind of only re regret, you know, but if they were here, they would be able to see my story. But that says, as I mentioned earlier, my mother kept photo albums. So it was never her intention to lose the photos that my father was shooting for whatever reason. Cause my, my mom's had this thing, whereas we're going to try to keep this family strong, right? We're just not going to let the outside forces in the world kind of destroy the family unit. No, I think that that's beautiful, Kurt. That that's all the motivation of doing things. Now, where did you start, and when did you start seriously being a photographer or taking taking pictures? Okay, I started ten, ten, about ten or eleven years ago. I started taking pictures. I rep, I was representing this photographer, um, Bob Gore, and uh, he was a he he he. I met him at my church, and he was a, a photographer of African American worship, and I was representing him on a few projects. So, after he saw like the success of me representing his photography, he said, "Kirk, hey." I'm gonna give you this camera. Just go out and shoot pictures. Don't worry about how good it looks. Just go out and shoot. And he, he left me this nugget. He told me that if I'm taking pictures and I'm the only one at a particular scene, it don't matter how 
good or legendary photographer I am is that I got the shot and that I would own the shot. So it kind of got me thinking that, oh, okay, let me try to shoot. So what I did, I started shooting, it was a digital camera and I started shooting. And since I was a messenger, right? I organically photographed uh, bike messengers. Bike messengers and foot messengers, right? I started shooting and then I continued to shoot. And then um, I started to uh, include the, my photo practice into my books. So basically, Joe, I'm a writer. I'm a writer by heart. So when I would do my books about messenger life, I would hire photographers to do, to do the photography for me, right? I didn't shoot myself. So I did all these books. So when I started shooting for myself, I started including the photo- my own photography in, in the books, in That's my own book. Kurt. That, yeah. you know, it's like, uh, it's, you know, wonderful to hear about it. And right now we're going to take a wee break and we'll get back in a few minutes. So hang on there. Hang okay. on. Okay. Okay. is the canary in the coal mine. What happens to New York is going to wind up happening in your city and in your community. We are going to fight every way we can to save every life that we can. 
We are all first responders. Your actions can either save or endanger a life. Job one has to be save lives. That has to be the priority. I may never have met you. We don't go way back. Maybe we wouldn't even be friends if we did. But when you wear a mask, you have my respect. Because your mask doesn't protect you. It protects me. I wear my mask to protect you. Be New York tough. Mask up, America. Okay, we're back from the break. Now we'll continue. Now, I kind of like myself kept up and did a little here, did a little there, the little street photography. What happened was being downtown, I noticed that the areas were changing. Things were getting gentrified, hanging around Soho, Lower East Side. It disappeared. So little by little, I decided to record the, we'll say, demise of the city or demise of the street art. I was more into uh, recording the graffiti, the street mm -hmm. art. So little by little, what happened is that things disappeared. I would take the shot. It was a great shot. And I would come back maybe three, four months later. And it was a hole in the ground, Kurt. Wow. Excavation, it said, please do not post bill. <laughs> and before that, what it was, was basically, you know, a building, a building, okay. a wall. It, it was something that existed. It was somebody who did work, who was an artist, whether it was like, paint or spray paint or what. This was something that I considered to be as artistic as anything in a museum. And it would okay. disappear. And when I would run after it and then run a couple blocks and find another piece. And okay. then a couple blocks down, see another piece. And I continuously recorded this and everything would disappear. So I got from Soho to the East Village. Uh, Lower East Side, and little by little, I would record and kind of like keep it. And hopefully, you know, I would put it in a book or, but it was recorded. It didn't disappear from, from so, you know, ever. So what, so what year, what years was that? What years were you, you recording those? I think those? it was basically, uh, you know, within the last uh, 15, 20 years. So oh. a gentrification would come in and I would see something and it would be gone. But the next day I would find something else that was beautiful and I would take the shot. And then that was preserved, at least in my head and on film. So I would go back and forth, walk block to block, back and forth and take the shots. And hopefully they would still be there. In most cases, they weren't. So, you know, I just built up sort of the history of the area. Okay, the so you so, so you have, actions. Okay, so so uh so did you work in that area or you just wanted to go well in that area? I basically was retired. Oh okay. I worked as a letter carrier and I worked as every imaginable job because I couldn't kind of get my feet firmly affixed. The only thing I had, you know, was basically keeping my family, you know, supporting the family, you know, educating the kids and everything like that. So that was my particular thing. But we're missing more of Kurt Boom. Now you got to tell your story of, uh, you know, when you're again a teenager, when you're a young adult. What was your perspective? What did you do? Okay, so. So basically, I'm I'm uh, uh, I'll tell you my secret. I'm I'm 60 years old, right? So I started taking pictures at at 49 years old. But 
as I mentioned earlier, I already had a history in studying photography. So I already knew how, I already knew what a good image was. I just didn't, I just didn't photograph it myself. So I came in with a lot of knowledge. And so when I started shooting, I started shooting my, my environment. So I was a messenger, so I traveled all over the city to uh, Brooklyn, Bronx, uh, Manhattan, Staten Island. You know, the streets was, was where I worked. So I would photograph the streets. But what I, what I would do, Joe, is I, w- I would narrow in on a subject. I would narrow in on a subject and then I would concentrate on a particular subject and photograph that subject. So one of the big subjects that I photographed were subway, subway performers. So I spent five years concentrating shooting subway performers. So over those five years, I had shot maybe 500 different musicians. And I went to a publisher with it and they offered me a contract. So I was able to get this book published called Subway Beats because of my photographic work documenting subway performers. So I, that was my first kind of niche. Then uh, I was photographing a lot of bike messengers. So that was my second niche, right? And then I started photographing skateboarders. And then recently in the last two years, I've been photographing a lot of street art. So uh, what about the pandemic, the recent problems, even with uh, Black Lives Matter? Well, okay. Very good question. So I was doing messenger work during the pandemic. So I was photographing the streets on the pandemic. So I have a lot of photographs from what the streets look like in Manhattan, primarily. I did shoot a little Brooklyn. I shot a little bit of the Bronx, but I was out there as uh, what you call an essential worker. So I was allowed to be on the streets. If I wasn't a messenger, I wouldn't have been out there. But since I'm a messenger, I was allowed to be on the streets. So I photographed like virtually everything you could think of that was on the streets. and so the trains were empty. So if you could think of the train system being empty, I took pictures of that and it's very haunting. And then the stores, the stores were empty. Stores were closed, as a matter of fact. So you saw all these signs on these retail stores that they were closed because of COVID-19. So I would photograph all these retail stores closed. I would photograph these hotels. The virtually whole, the whole Manhattan Island was completely shut down. So it was like a ghost town for like two months. And I, photo, I photographed a lot of that. So I'm currently participating in a, in a number of ex- expeditions. <clears throat> One expedition I'm in is it's called ICP Concern. And it's at the International Center of Photography. And they have one of my images in there. And then I'm also doing something with the City Museum of New York for their uh, New York Responds ex- expedition. So, so I was out there. And I also have a lot of photographs of the Black Lives Matter protests and stuff. And I have, um, I have a website uh, de- dedicated to my photographs for the COVID-19, it's called um, silence, silenceofthepandemic.net. So you can see some of my photographs from uh, COVID-19, but I, I did shoot a lot of that as well. No, you've been around and you've done the best, more than the best of most of the, uh, the opportunities you, you got. So I always thought when I was on the street, that I was in a visual candy store. And I was always with the camera, always out. And to me, this was like 
candy. I had my <laughs> hands filled with images and yeah. all these things that I seen, the people I seen, and uh, the art, the street art I had seen was just uh, overwhelming. And I have like so many images of that. I sold my photography on the street in Soho. Hung wow. out, hung out, and loved to hang out. Use the camera, take pictures of other subjects and people and whatever. So to me, I would say it kept me in the game, it kept me mentally young. A lot of it's physically young too. You're chasing the image. But the whole idea is that this, in a sense, is my life and, in a sense, your life. You know, mm -hmm. you appreciate what you see and you're excited by what you see on the street. And that's the most important, you know, mm -hmm. important thing for life because this is basically the chapter of my life where I am a creative person and I enjoy being a creative person. Because basically, we, the camera is a certain type of weapon in a way, if you use it the right way. I've been in, I've photographed demonstrations, occupied Wall Street. I've been with the people who have been demonstrating. I've even dealt with the police. Interesting. So I found Kurt to be not antagonistic, but frightened. I've hmm. gone and talked to like, especially younger cops who look like they're straight out of Staten Island or North Bronx. And uh, they're afraid of the demonstrators. It's not that they're mad at the demonstrators, they're afraid of the demonstrators. So hmm. your camera is a weapon, you're respected on the street. You, I think you know that, mm -hmm. and I know that. So in closing, I'd like to say, I'm happy you came. This is a good experience because it's not an interview, it's a shared experience between mm -hmm. two street photographers who can't stop pressing the shutter. So, <laughs> so Kurt, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate you, and I hope you come back. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Joe.